All right. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Uh, this is Jelani Hashim Bracey, CEO of the nonprofit Black to Life. And we want to welcome you to our Black to Life BIPOC author series. And uh, this is one of our, uh, this is the first of this initiative where we uh, invite diverse authors uh, from our community to actually give their product, to read their books. And we also have a conversation with them, you know, just to get into their mind and the creative thought process of, you know, how they became who they are. And today, uh, Grace in our presence is the great Miss Kaziah Snipes. And uh, she will be reading her book, uh, Close and Away. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give your undivided attention and Miss Kaziah Snipes, uh, have it. And I'll be back, you know, to talk about it and uh, ask you for questions. So here you go. So the title of this book is Close and Away, written by myself, my name is Keziah Snipe, and illustrated by Ashley T. Johnson. Nine big balloons, as wide as the moon, float in the sky on the 19th of July. The sound of the crunchy sidewalk under mama's flats. My baby brother's loud and squeaky laughs echo in the noontime on the 19th of July. We're celebrating and we're remembering, Mama said, half smiling like she does. My big brother that almost was. See, I'm the oldest now, but I wasn't always the oldest child. JJ came three years before me but only stayed a little while. He fought for his life a few days. Then, Mama said, he got tired. Now he's in the clouds where he can rest all the time. So every 19th of July, we buy cake and we buy balloons. And Mama talks about JJ just like he's in the room. We laugh at the jokes and stories, and then we gather outside. We write a special note on each balloon and let them float up to the sky. I wonder if JJ thinks about me the way I think about him. I wonder if he wishes he was still here with us to learn and read and run and play and swim. But I'm glad he's my heaven brother and that he gets to rest and fly and that we always celebrate him every 19th of July. Thank you. All right, appreciate that. Miss Keziah Snipes with the book Close and Away. Beautiful book, beautiful read. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. So I just have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, you can tell everybody uh, where you're from and uh, what actually inspired you 
to be uh to become an author. Wonderful. Okay. So my name is Kaziah Stipe. I am originally from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, born and raised in Memphis. And I've been writing since I was seven years old. Um, the first thing that I ever wrote was a poem. Um, because somewhere it was in my mind that the word should always rhyme. <laughs> And so um, I just kept up with it from there. All the words rhyme. I don't know if you know this, but in close in a way, all the words rhyme. Um, and so I've always written that way. Poetry has always been a thing for me. And so, um, yeah, I've written for a very long, very, very, very long time. And uh, writing is my outlet. It is the way I express myself. It is the way I heal. It is the way I learn and the way that I grow. That's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Memphis, I'm very familiar with Memphis. Used to live there myself. What part of uh, Memphis are you from? So I was kind of all over Memphis. I was born in South Memphis. Um, all right. Born in South Memphis and then uh, moved toward Whitehaven and from Whitehaven moved toward East Memphis, the Hickory Hill area, not too far yeah. from um, Germantown, uh, but that area. So That's cool. I used to, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, I used to stay, I did stay for a minute in North Memphis, um, off Jackson Avenue. I oh, stayed yeah. In, <laughs> stayed in, um, uh, what other parts? Stayed in, not West Memphis, because that's not Memphis. That's, that's, that's Arkansas. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I used to, uh, so, yeah. oh, Midtown, okay. Yeah, I used to teach at, uh, uh, when I was there at Sherwood Middle School. Okay, Sherwood, yeah. Yeah, Orange Mound. Yeah, right down. Yeah, 3480 Rhodes Avenue. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I used to I used to live in Bartlett off of Sycamore View, so okay. that's not really the city, but, you know, I, I worked in the city. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love Memphis, man. Memphis is one of my favorite cities. I, uh, when I went to college at Russ, Russ College is right there, like 30 minutes from Memphis, so uh, I'm very familiar with Memphis, and uh, Nice town, man. I'm with a beautiful city, beautiful people, so I can definitely dig it. So, uh, so how many books have you written since you know you say you've been writing since seven and this is a healing for you? Uh, how many books have you written? So, I've written a total of let me count, I've written a total, I've written three uh poetry books. Mm -hmm. Um, and as far as children's books, Close and Away is my first children's book. Uh, the second children's book is in currently in the illustration phase. Uh, so three children's books. I mean, I'm sorry, three poetry books and two children's books so far. Okay, so close and away is your latest project, right? Like that, that's finished. It's my latest, what was the it's my latest book? Yes. Okay, what was the inspiration behind this? Well, um, as you can imagine, I love children. Love working with children. Um, I have worked with kids in a lot of different capacities. Um, in this particular instance, I was working at a creative arts summer camp, and I was a creative writing counselor. And so um, one of the things that was always important to me for the kids to do was to feel comfortable expressing themselves, um, no matter what the expression was about, um, and not be so concerned about what their peers would think, not be so concerned about what people would think, but to feel comfortable expressing themselves because if they can say it out loud they can write it down um, right and so they don't you know kids don't always have the space to express themselves in that way but this is a creative writing camp this is a creative arts camp so this is where you express yourself this is the space for you to do that and so um just different conversations uh with the kids and they started if you let kids talk long enough anybody anybody long enough but kids specifically if you let them talk long enough you'll really hear what they want to say you'll hear what they want to say um and for some people they'll write it off as oh it's just it's just a kid talking i don't know what they're talking about mm, just listen just listen and so um the children you know initially started talking you know i i asked the hard questions to kids and so the boys and the girls i'm like what are you afraid of so immediately the boys hype up, Papa. Oh, I'm not afraid of nothing. I'm scared of nothing. I don't care. I'm scared of nothing. 
And so one little boy, he would always talk, I'm not scared of nothing. Nothing scares me. I'm not scared of nothing. I'm like, okay. Um, I said, there's a snake behind your chair. And he's like, oh. <laughs> oh. Now you told me you weren't afraid of anything. I don't like snakes. I'm not scared of them. <laughs> so we would, right. the, the goal was to get him to feel comfortable enough to talk about these things and feel safe enough to talk about these things. And I had one little girl in particular who she started talking about her family and how she loves her family. She got the best family in the world. And how we always, talk, she talks about her little, her little cousin who passed away. And they always release balloons for her cousin and they get t-shirts made for her cousin. Um, and she misses her big cousin, and oh, no, her little cousin. And um, she talked about it. She talked about it so passionately. You would have thought you were talking to a 35-year-old woman. This baby mm. was seven. And I had some concerns because I'm like, she's seven. At this age, she should be absolutely carefree, right? She shouldn't have any worries. She shouldn't be worried about somebody who passed away. She shouldn't be she shouldn't this this shouldn't be a burden on her. But kids experience things just like adults do. Um, they just experience them in their in their way, in their in their world. Way, yeah, in their seven year old yep. world. And I said, I gotta I gotta write about this. I, I gotta write about this. And I ended up talking to her family, talking to her mom when she came and picked her up. I said, I want to write a book about what she told me about. And she said, yeah, you should. And so that's where Close to Noise came from. Man, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that seven-year-old girl, like you said, could uh, express herself in that way to where you could understand. And it was, you know, like we, we expect certain things from seven-year-olds. And the fact that you allowed that space open for her, you know, because a lot of times as grown up, uh, we do, especially as educators, uh, you know, as talking to kids, we talk to them and not, well, no, we talk at them and not to them and not with them and allow uh, back and forth banter. So that, that was, that was amazing. And uh, I'm, I bet the little girl, uh, did you give her a copy of the book? Has she seen it? Absolutely. Yeah. That probably did wonders for her, man. Uh, how did that affect her? Did it, uh, did you see any changes in her or how did she, well, you by know, the time, take just that. Kind of going through the, because we we did self publish. So by by you know going through the self publishing process and just going through that process in general. Um, by the time we got to it, the, the the creative arts camp was long over with. But uh, getting it to her, I dropped it off at her mom's house uh, when when the book first came out, and. I showed it to her. She said, because this was in Baltimore. She was looking through it. And she said, Oh, this looks like Baltimore. I said, It does. She said, Yeah, it's got like the houses like we got. And I'm like, because you know Baltimore's full of row houses. Row houses, yeah. Said, it's got houses like we got. She said, Oh, and the balloon. She's like, we <laughs> he's a Baltimore talk. Believe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's just like for my cousin. It's just like for my cousin. I said, "Yeah, girl, you inspired this book." Oh my god! Thank you, Miss K. You know, she was really, um, and she was really grateful and really appreciative. And I saw her mom kind of welling up a little bit, and so um, it was a it was a really special experience. And even when I first the first time I did a read aloud of this book was at a Boys and Girls Club, and that was a whole experience by itself, which was also in Baltimore. Um, that was a whole experience by itself. It's just, it's been nothing but fruitful. That's what's up, man. That 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 that's cool. So, with that being said, uh, Supar, how do you approach, uh, you know, incorporating cultural themes or experiences into your writing, and can you discuss the significance of that representation, particularly for our Black readers or Black writers? Like, 
how does that, you know, how do you approach putting that in? And then what is the significance of it? Um, listen, there was, I read plenty of good books as a kid. Like I was definitely that kid who read all the, all the books, you know, um, Miss Nelson is missing. Alexander and the Terrible Heart with No Good, Very Bad Day. Very bad day. Uh, <laughs> you know, just all those, all those great babysitters club. Um, oh yeah. Uh, Sweet Valley Twins. Uh, I was the, I was a reader. I was a reader, and none of the people in those books looked like me. Great, great stories. Right. None of them looked like me, and. You don't think it impacts you, but it does because you go into the world expecting the world to look like what you read, mm -hmm. expecting the faces in the world to look like the faces that you saw in the books that you read. And I am proud to be amongst a group of people who are like, nah, uh-uh. You're going to get this black skin, right on. quality books, and you're going to see yourself in these books. You're going to be able to relate to these characters in these books. You're going to get this black skin. You're going to get this uh, this kinky, curly, coily, nappy hair. You're going to get this, all of this. You're going to see yourself in these books if I got a right of myself. And that's that was the mindset that I had. If I got a right of myself, that's what you're going to see. And I love how diverse it is in books with black kids. It's not just black kids talking about black history. It's not just black kids talking about black figures. It's black kids experiencing everyday thing that kids experience just to carry everyday life. To be black. Yeah. Right. It's diverse and I love that. And so I have, I do have a dedication for that. So I'm very particular about even who is working on this book. Like I wrote it, I'm black. The illustrator is, a, is an I'm black woman. The illustrator is a black woman. Um, that was done on purpose. I know plenty. I know quite a few illustrators. Mm -hmm. Just like I know quite a few books that have black characters on the front. And black characters in them are written by white folks. Right. No one can tell our story Nobody can tell better than we can. Us. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And while we appreciate those, right, you know, those uh those efforts, like you said, our community can tell it best. Exactly. This yeah. Like this reminds me of something. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you good, you good. No, I was reminding when you said uh the characters in the book, when you see those characters, that's the world that you expect to see outside. And I believe now, man, you just triggered something in me like my mom and dad, you know, they must have thought that on some level because every book I read, all my characters were brown. Like, mm. and, and what they did, because I grew up in the 80s. I born in 79, but I grew up in the 80s. So there were no black books to speak of but I didn't know that my parents would color the characters brown so every time I read a book every time I mean it from Santa Claus to anything I always thought the world looked like me and my family but and and I and and it came to my mind when when it really hit me I I had uh I have a son and a daughter when my son was born I was looking for books and I went to my, uh, my mom's house uh, for for a holiday. And I was like, hey, mom, can I get those uh, black books that I had when I was a kid? And she was like, what what black books you had? I was like, you know, the books that y'all read me when I was little? She was like, well, we colored those books. Like we, we, I was like, what? And so I went to the back in my room, looked in the box, and looked at it, and I never put that together because all I saw was me. So I never thought they changed that. So man, shout out to moms and pops for that, man. And shout out to you for incorporating that as well. And that's the reason I became an author as well, because I wanted to see us and wanted my kids to see us in books told by us. Absolutely. So yeah, kudos to that, man. Uh, 
really appreciate you in this journey because like you said, there are others that write about us, but can't nobody do it like us. Can't nobody give it that flavor. Can't nobody just give it, you know, what it needs to be given but us. So I do appreciate that. Uh, another question I have for you. Do you see any uh, challenges? Have you had any challenges as a Black author in the publishing industry? I know you spoke of self-publishing. I've done that as well. But have you seen any challenges as being a Black author in this industry? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that I've experienced is that there is there are wellsprings of information. Um, and you might not necessarily know which spring to drink from. Mm. Um, I think there's, and I think there's lots of people who are attempting to capitalize off of you not knowing which spring to drink from. Right. Uh, so there's lots of workshops, and lots of courses, and lots of this, and lots of that, and lots of this, and lots of that. That well, are you looking to self-publish by this book? Are you looking to self-publish by my course? Are you looking to self-publish? Uh, I'll be your coach. Are you looking to self-publish? Yep. <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's it's not that deep. It's I mean, if you really like honest, if you really want to self-publish, you can just go to Amazon. Yeah, and Katie and Kendall Direct Publishing will walk you right through it. Like, no doubt. If you want to do it, even if you want to go to, you know, you want to print hard copies of your book, you can go to thebookpatch.com and they will print your books. They got a variety of sizes and they, they ship pretty quickly. They're pretty good. You turn around and Ain't yep. no spark book baby. Ain't no spark. It's a lot of options. Like, and I think some people sometimes people get so overwhelmed with what they feel like the process is that they just don't. So I think the biggest, I think there's just a lot. It's you don't have to search too hard to find capitalism. You don't have to search all over too America. Hard. It's all over. You don't have to search too hard. You don't have to search too far to find it. And I understand everybody's got to make money. We got to live in the society that we live in and the system that we live in. We have to make money. But, and I'll always say, at what cost? True that. At what cost? So, yeah, um, I think if you can get above the fray, um, by all means, you can publish a book, but there's that, and then there's also marketing, and then you run into the same monster. You need help marketing your book by my course. Man, you need help marketing my book. By my book. <laughs> <laughs> Take this course. <laughs> I'll be your coach. I'll be your mentor, yep. bruh. And you don't know. I still get calls to this day. This book came out. Close and Away came out in 2022. I got a call the other day from some marketing company. Your yeah. book Close and Away has been chosen by our publishing company to um, for us to offer you marketing at a low, low rate. How did y'all get my phone number? Man. Internet. Folks got time to scour the internet. They got time to scour it. They got time to scour for everything. You know, like you said, capitalism is everywhere. So they trying to make a book, trying to make a book. So we got to look out, like you said, you got to look out for that. And this is easy as going, like you said, Amazon, KDP, Ingram Spark, Book Baby. Uh, there's a lot of avenues that you can go through. You just got to search for it. And uh, search through the minutia of the people trying to get over on you. You know what I'm saying? Because we are the product. So we, we are, are the product. best people to it. market it. You know what I'm saying? So I can definitely dig that. Uh, what do you hope readers take away from your books? You know, especially what about those that may uh, not share your background or experience or may not even look like you? What would you hope uh, readers take away? Um, 
from your books? So one of the things that I think I, and I have to say this carefully because I don't want it to be misconstrued. You're not going to open my book and find a Pan-African flag, right? Like, uh -huh. it's not just blackly black, only for black folks. Black folks can read this book only and ain't nobody else going to relate. My book would, and it's funny because in Florida, my book would probably be banned. It says nothing about being black in this book, but the characters are black. So in Florida and other states, it would probably be banned. Yeah. Because the characters are black. Um, I want people to take away relativity. I want them to be able to relate to the story. Like twofold. I feel like the book is for children who have lost siblings or family members um, and also for parents who have had miscarriages or stillbirths uh, to find some sort of hope, some sort of solace uh, in the story. Um, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be from Nevea, who was the character telling the story. I wanted it to be from her point of view because I wanted it to maintain its innocence. Death is not something that we talk to kids about enough. And it's a difficult subject to talk. It's difficult for adults to talk about, let alone children. And so I want this to be a conversation starter between parents and children, between caregivers and children, to have that conversation, to at least start that conversation uh, about grief, mm. about, about someone passing away. Uh, and help, even if you can't help it make it make sense, you can at least create a forum, create a space for both of y'all to talk about it. So, yes, the opportunity. Yeah, that was the goal for that book. That's cool. Last question before I let you get out of here. Uh, how do you envision the future of Black literature and what role do you hope to play in shaping it? Listen, man, we are growing. I, I, black books are being released every day. Black children's books, black just black books in general are being released every day. Whether we get the Newbery Award or not, whether we are New York Times bestseller list or not, whether we are, whatever we getting and whatever we not getting, people are releasing. Black folks are writing more than ever and releasing books more than ever and I absolutely love it. I'm so happy to be part of the, this literary revolution that we are experiencing. This literary, I don't even want to say renaissance, because that would imply that something died. That's not what happened. It's just that now we have more recess, resources available to us um, to put books out there. We have more uh, community that is behind, um, you know, pushing books to the forefront. Uh, we have more, we just have more things now that are available for us to push these books forward and be like, hey, hey, hey. You don't get to tell my story for me. I can tell this story. I can, I can, I can push my own book. I can tell the story. I can, I can. Here, take, take, look at this. Oh, you want fiction? Got you. You want nonfiction? Got you. You want children's books? Got you. You want sci-fi? Got you. You want horror? Got you. You want romance? Got you. Can and keep going Cr across genres, whether we get a major publishing deal or not. We're less likely to get major publishing deals. That's not stopping us from pushing the book out. Right on. So like you said. Oh yeah. And I and I'm glad you're a part of it too. And like you said, man, uh black folks is gonna make it happen. No matter what the opportunities are, we just gonna, you know, take it by the horns and we're gonna make it happen. We we're gonna ride it. So I I appreciate your time, uh, Kazai, Kazai Snipes. Uh would you like to tell anybody everybody where they could get your book? Sure, you can visit alwaysrtkids.org and order a signed copy of the book. Or if you want it a little quicker, you can go to Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, bookshop.org. Uh, anywhere books are sold, you can buy it online and get it a lot quicker. Uh, so cool. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your support. Hey, no problem. Thank you. And you said, what's your website again? Alwaysrt? Always R alwaysrtkids.org. Always RT dot kid with always RT kids dot org. Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kazai Snipes.
once again, we thank you. Uh, the book is close in the way. Uh, go get you a copy and uh, please support uh, this author. Thank, thank you, you so much. For having me. All right. Appreciate it.